Uh, special welcome to the audience who are still uh, coming in. Um, especially, uh, particularly because it's a very, it's a pretty diverse group. Uh, it includes or comprises of uh, economists, political scientists, business school researchers, academics, students, uh, Laurier from Laurier, uh, University of Waterloo, and uh, CG, which is the Corporate Governance Institute here in Waterloo. In addition, we have uh, many technology professionals from the area, entrepreneurs, and members of the community at large. Uh, today's agenda is as follows. Uh, my esteemed colleague, uh, Benson Bonnick, who is the professor of management here at Gaudi, will introduce the speaker. Following that, uh, uh, Dr. Swami will deliver his lecture. Uh, we have allotted 30 minutes approximately for question answers from the uh, audience. Uh, Finally, um, my colleague uh, Tracy Snodden, who is a uh, professor of economics here, will propose to work facts and also present a little commentary. Uh, I now turn over the floor to Benson. Thank you. Joe Stiglitz, the economist, Cortez, a sociologist. None of us can escape it, but that's all discussion, you know, the debate that's happened in the last decade. Um, but if we look back further, there have been some kind of scholars that have looked at globalization before it was really a, a prominent force, when it was even perhaps not popular in certain environments to discuss it. Um, and it's always a pleasure to, to introduce a visionary, someone who takes academic work and does more than just um, uh, simply write the articles, but also has an impact in social force and social action, uh, and then continues uh, publishing and doing research. Um, the scholar, uh, Dr. Swami, has, uh, has actually, he actually did his thesis with two Nobel laureates, uh, Simon Kuznets and, uh, um, Simon Kuznets and Paul Samuelson. Paul Samuelson, right? So we've all read Samuelson's book, right? Which suggests that um, if you want a Nobel Prize, give him a PhD, right? That's the secret to success. Um, international interest. The uh, Time magazine in its European Asian edition is running a uh, seven article series on the subject of India and China. And uh, the, the first uh, two articles have been on India and stated uh, the idea that India is a poor country is a relatively recent one. The article goes on to emphasize that, and I quote, in hindsight, what is happening today with the rise of India and China is not some miraculous novelty, so much as a return to the traditional pattern of global trade in the medieval ancient world. So indeed, uh, there has been a sea change of transformation in outlook from regarding uh, India and China and the India until very recently, as a country of disease, poverty, uh, beggars, etc., to a country which is uh, returning to its uh, position uh, of great preeminence economically uh, in the global world. In fact, uh, by then pre modern economic standards, uh, India and China were the two most developed countries up to about 1790. And it's really after the Industrial Revolution and imperialism that the decline started for the two countries. Complain that the ships have become empty and then buy the goods and take them back. Could the, could the king not consider buying something from the United States of America? And uh, the king said, well, there's everything available here. Uh, what do I want to buy from your country? So they said, you can think of something. Please do, because we don't want to make the ships become empty. And finally he said, well, I live in South India, I've never seen ice. It's up in the north, I have to go all the way to the Himalayas to see it. So I hear that in your country, ice is easily available, and particularly in winter. So I, I'd like to, uh, you to bring me ice. So when the winter, the pond froze, they cut it up uh, into ice blocks, put sawdust on it, and took it all the way to India to sell it. And that was the uh, state of... Uh, inequality in the industrial 
uh, have performances of uh, in India and China uh, with the best. That has that was transformed, and uh, the between the periods of 1870 and 1950, the decline in the two countries was very sharp and steep. And by 1950, both countries had become the world's poorest countries from being the world's richest countries. Now, after independence, and before I talk about recent progress, I'd like to just give you a little background because it's important to see the context in which what is happening today is remarkable. After independence in India and uh, liberation in China, uh, between the years 1950 to 1980, those 30 years, India and China recovered because between 1870 and 1950, the best estimates for growth rates in the two countries is GDP growth rate of half a percent per year. And he was also not in favor. But then they died prematurely, uh, or untimely, I would say. And the net result is that Nehru, who got uh, complete unquestioned power, uh, was by inclination a socialist, and he adopted the Soviet economic model. The Soviet economic model called for extraction of resources from agriculture to finance industrial development. And the Indian agriculture had already been bled during the British period through the revenue collecting uh, machinery of the Zamindari system. And there was, it was a dire need of new investment. And there was no scope for its uh, uh, you know, resources being made available by agriculture for financing industrial development. And as a consequence, we had a major food problem. And uh, ultimately, over the years, the Soviet model uh, became unpopular, and finally, with the, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, the Soviet model lost its patron, and uh, as a consequence, uh, the, in, the, in a situation of crisis in 1991, we adopted economic reform. And I have to say, I was part of that uh, team which drew up the economic reform, uh, uh, economic reform package, although. Uh, the credit uh, naturally would go to the then Prime Minister, Mr. Narsimha Rao, and uh, his finance minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, who is now the Prime Minister. And these kinds of uh, data corrections are necessary. And uh, in the, in the Chinese authorities put so much pressure on the provincial levels to produce statistics quickly that I am sometimes suspicious whether the data you get, as which are passed off as constant price estimates are really current price estimates. And I would say that any estimates of China that you have, uh, uh, that you get on growth rates, in, for example, growth rates of GDP, you should perhaps knock off one and a half to two percent of that and get the correct answer. If they say they're growing at 11 percent, they're growing at nine. Nine is also pretty substantial. Because I won't go so far as uh, Professor Tom Brofsky I don't know whether he's from Toronto or Montreal. Uh, he was at Harvard, so I knew him when he was a student. Uh, he went so far as to say that they, uh, the Chinese actually cooked the books. Well, I, I don't quite agree that they cooked the books. It's very difficult to cook the books. Then you'll have to have two sets of books, one for the politician and one for the general public. And then once you start cooking up, then you have to go on increasing cooking. <laughs> You know, and uh, it, it soon will explode. So I, I don't agree with that view. But I would say that uh, indeed uh, uh, we have, when we compare India and China, India has been a great disadvantage because it's an open society and everything about India gets published, whereas China is still continues to be a controlled society and therefore uh, it's, uh, uh, it's what is really happening. You learn very late. Uh, I think this is one very important thing that's developing because both China and India have a problem of agricultural labor surplus. And China has to move perhaps another 200 million people out of agriculture in order to make the agriculture more sustainable. Uh, India also could do with uh, moving its, uh, its uh, extra labor in, in agriculture to industry. Uh, services are not that. Uh, uh, not that employment intensive. So, uh, how that is done in the few coming years is something that's going to be very important. 
So I would say this is one. Second, the second thing I, you have to notice about the recent progress between India and China, the Chinese have essentially uh, supplied the demand, or provided the demand for the supply in booming in labor intensive manufacturers by exports. They have exported to the West in large amounts. And what is interesting about these exports is, about the Chinese foreign trade is, that when you look a little below the surface, you find two things very coming out very clearly. One is that Chinese exports are perhaps 65% uh, reprocessed products. That is, products which were originally being produced in East Asia, going directly to Europe and to North America, are now going through China, getting reprocessed, and then uh, a little value addition, and then being exported to the West. In other words, if you were to add the trade from China to the West, and the trade of East Asia to the West, that as a ratio of GDP hasn't changed at all. In other words, China has a deficit in trade with East Asia. It has a surplus in trade with West. And that surplus is more than the deficit, and that's how they produce uh, their trade surplus. So I asked my response secretary whether we could organize that. He said it's impossible because the total production of Indian software is only $100 million. How are we going to provide a billion dollars to the Samsung Corporation? That was the position. It all changed. Today, if India is uh, going to be an $80 billion IT industry, and uh, it's the, the impetus was given by the Y2K. So India is basically a software-dominated IT market, whereas the Chinese are uh, a hardware-dominated uh, market. Their software is a small part of their IT industry and it is mostly used within India, within their country. And it is lower order, blue collar blue level software. India has software but 70% of it is exported. Indian industry barely uses it. In fact, if textile industries were to use uh, the, for quality control the IT, it would become a challenger to China. Today, China is unchallenged in the textile world, uh, thanks to the WTO. But India uh, has is not, do not been a match except in the garment area because of this, of this particular fact. So I think uh, we, uh, we must know that the IT between the two countries cannot be compared. Although China is making heroic efforts to see that the software improves, but they have an essential problem, perhaps we have one of the unintended consequences of British rule in India is that most of us speak English fluently and that has given us great access to Western markets and for China and that's a disadvantage. I don't, I don't, I'm not arguing that the British deliberately in order to enable us to have an IT revolution uh, <laughs> made us English. It was an unintended consequence. Collected from the suburbs of Bombay and uh, they are put on trains uh, brought and then separated and delivered in the offices so that your home food arrives you to arrive for you to eat and then the empty lunch boxes are collected back and delivered back with a 0.001 error. It's an amazing, uh, uh, amazing organizational innovative uh, 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 enterprise which has now started receiving international attention. So much so that uh, uh, the uh, Prince of England, uh, Prince Charles, uh, was so taken up that in his wedding uh, he had uh, uh, these uh, uh, the managements, uh, the, ma the managers of this enterprise come specially to England uh, to be guests of honor at his wedding. Uh, here is something to be seen. This is the, the this aspect of innovation which is backed by India's democracy because it's impossible to have innovation without free thinking and free thinking requires democracy. That's another great advantage that India has over China. And uh, so 
uh, I would say this is another. The agriculture is one area. The, re, re, uh, re, uh, the change in direction of the exports, uh, reprocessing exports uh, towards India is another area. And the third area is innovation, where India has already shown in design work uh, how much progress it can make. Today, the entire uh, chip from the Texas Instruments uh, comes out of uh, Bangalore. I'm, uh, of course, Bangalore now has become all kinds of things. The other day I saw a taxi with a big <coughs> billboard saying, Jesus wants you, call him at so and so telephone number. So <laughs> I dialed the number to find out whether in fact I could reach Jesus. And the man, this man, pious man came and he said, What troubles you, my boy, and all that. And, uh, uh, but I felt that the, that accent had a, some ring, although it was a very Americanized accent. I felt that there's something Indian about it. So I asked him, where are you calling from? Uh, and he said, from Bangalore. <laughs> so even uh, Bible uh, presentations is now being outsourced. <laughs> so finally, I would say the most crucial thing that uh, that exists in the progress, recent progress between India and China, is the financial system. Let us know what, let us, that history is strewn with examples of countries which progressed very fast and then had a blowout and never recovered. Latin America is an example. Yeah. There was a time when people thought Argentina would overtake the United States. And then again in 1950s and 60s, they thought. Uh, like, um, um, uh, Argentina, Chile, uh, Brazil, these are the countries which are the next candidates for being the developer to the world. They have had a blowout in 81 and they have not recovered. Then you had East Asia. East Asia was in fact touted by the World Bank as the model. And uh, in fact the World Bank brought out a book volume called The East Asian Miracle in which they said to said all developing countries must learn that East Asia learn has got its basics right. That is why they are making progress. You also must imitate those basics. And uh, in 1997, two years after the book came out, there was a blow up because the World Bank has since written a, uh, a companion volume called East Asian Miracle Reconsidered. Uh, and uh, Mr. Stiglitz came here, you ought to have asked him because he's the author of the first uh, book and the second. And uh, they explained that you know this was not right, that was not right. But the key thing is that if you look at why some countries have progressed and stayed developed countries, why some countries have grown and then had a blowout and then not been able to recover, Including Japan, there was Japan in 1979 was portrayed as a country to be number one in in 10 or 20 years, from 20 years hence. But in 1999, it was a basket case almost, and it still is in, in a lot of problems. Uh, Japan went up went up so fast they bought up buildings in the United States. They bought up Rockefeller Center. People thought that even the United States would be bought by Japan, but it didn't happen, didn't happen that way. We have to understand what the reasons are. And Professor Richard Silla uh, was also uh, one, um, uh, when I was a young assistant professor, I was a, was a student in my class, but I knew him as a personal friend. He's professor at the New York University at the Stern, uh, Stern School. He has written a president, his presidential address to the American Economic History Association says that invariably the key distinguishing feature between countries which make progress and remain pro uh, progressing and those which progress very quickly and then have a blowout is the financial system. If you condition, then you will not have this problem. Both India and China have financial problems and these problems need solutions. And you have to see whether those solutions will be forthcoming or not, otherwise both countries are candidates for a blowout the same way Latin America was, the same way East Asia was. And what is that problem? First of all, in the case of India, uh, all the government budgets, central and state, are essentially bankrupt. They are being sustained by, by unorthodox means. The Indian central government budget today is financed by loans impounded by the government 
from state-owned public sector banks which account for 85% of the deposits even today. Even today, the banks have not been denationalized or privatized. And the government is holding on firm. And about 50% of the funds which are due, which are, the, uh, if the Chinese were to compromise on growth in order to produce these other changes, and certainly they would have to uh, cut on uh, fixed, and, uh, fixed assets investment, they will have to prune the loans being given by banks to the state-owned enterprises. These major changes would slow, slow the growth rate and uh, that would be unacceptable to China. Or alternatively, China could free its private sector and say, you, uh, you get money from abroad, you get money from the banks and you give us an efficient economy. But that means an independent source of power <coughs> in China. That on that issue, the German Communist Party is very clear. No independent source of power other than one single source, and that's the Communist Party. And therefore, if there's a compromise to be made, give up reforms and keep your party, or give up your, weaken your party and have more reforms, I think the Chinese Communists are very clear that they will prefer what preserves their party. And that's why nowadays they're talking about harmonious <coughs> society and uh, a, a, an acceptance of authority and things like that in the conclusion. As, so, and success of implementing the family planning policies in China, China's uh, proportion of young working force will start declining from 2015. India has no prospect of that decline in place till 2050. This has deep implications for a, the financial system because Pension system, for example, is based on on uh, new people contributing and and that being used to provide social security and pension to those retiring. And if the number of people retiring turns out to be larger than the number of people entering the labor force. Actually, you're going to have a pension bomb, which is which Europe is facing. But India requires to educate these people, and a major educational transformation is necessary. I would say that uh, Canada's role <coughs> is really in this number one area, and that is in the education. Thanks to the diaspora here, uh, there's been a major change in Canadian attitudes after a fair amount of roller coaster ride in our relations. Uh, began as both thinking that we have similar backgrounds, common backgrounds. We have mid-sized powers and we play a role, and, but unfortunately the nuclear test, uh, 1974, first soured the relations, and then again in 1998. Of course, you also had some uh, activist foreign minister whose idiom uh, exacerbated relations quite a lot. But uh, today, I would say that there are a number of areas where India is looking to Canada uh, to uh, uh, to uh, help build. One is India's financial sector in modernizing the financial services. Second is in the mining sector, where uh, China have uh, done the democracy and demography and the sheer stability provided by our diversity uh, is our strong point. Uh, whereas for China, the inability to uh, to uh, develop, have devolution of political power is the one that would be the major stumbling block. This is what I want to say. Thank you very much. Dr. Swami, my name is Amar Badami. I am in the financial uh, business in Canada, and I follow politics and economics of India pretty closely. One of the issues that you brought up was that Nassim Rao, Chandra Babu Naidu, and Nassim Krishna didn't get re-elected. And the only thing is that is because they didn't address the issues in rural India. And and you talk about the suicide rates that are going up. What is the government of India uh, plan to do about this? How are they going to address that? Well, <clears throat> first of all, I'll take your second question first and then the other one. There's nothing anybody can do unless 
the price that the farmer receives is much higher than what they're getting today. And that is not possible because a higher price would mean inflation and inflation will mean defeated elections. So every government is trying to do this by giving out doles, by, uh, by, by, uh, by subsidies, etc. These are not good propositions because they don't they do not reach uh, the farm. The only way to rescue Indian agriculture is by globalizing it, by being enabling the farmer to export. And uh, that is the key way in which agriculture can be uh, moved. And that would require, first of all, giving up your land reform legislation, which uh, doesn't allow land consolidation, giving up all the market restrictions of travel for, uh, for, for farm products, and to have uh, a modern infrastructure that enables you to package, storehouse, uh, cold storage, and to be able to provide the market intelligence through internet you know, to the farmer to be able to sell abroad. That's the only way Indian agriculture can be rescued. Otherwise, you definitely could have the world on your hands. Second question, uh, what is the reason for the defeat? Uh, well, I, I think, you know, they were defeated in urban areas also. In the city of Hyderabad, where the maximum change is taking place, the Telugu Desam got a, the worst defeat possible. The city of Bangalore went wholesale to the BJP in the last uh, election. Uh, so I, I don't think that uh, it's got to do with the fact that they didn't address rural problems. Uh, it is got to do with the fact that uh, the those best interests who felt threatened were able to have money and the infrastructure to campaign and mobilize. My interests are in immigration and development plans. And I'm interested, you didn't mention a comparison between India and China with regards to things like remittances. I wonder if you would mind that. Yeah, well, uh, there's no doubt that uh, the share of uh, uh, non resident Chinese to Chinese uh, investment fund is, uh, is a high proportion, increasing proportion in the case of India. It is a, a declining proportion, although it's not uh, not a small proportion. The uh, uh, the remittances did uh, help us, particularly the remittances from the West Asia or Middle East, uh, did help India in the in the 80s, uh, late 70s, uh, to tide over the foreign exchange shortage. Uh, but uh, we also know that 1990, <coughs> part of the financial crisis we had was the panic in the uh, overseas Indian community about uh, the, uh, the ability of the Indian government to not declare bankruptcy. And uh, they uh, did pull out a, a suddenly a $2 billion out of the country. And uh, so um, remittances are important, but I don't think they can be a real substitute. The difference between India and China is that Chinese uh, diaspora is market savvy uh, and they are all around the rim. They are in Taiwan, they are in Hong Kong, they are in Singapore, they are in Indonesia in business, they are in Malaysia in business, uh, in Philippines. And they have been very helpful to China in enabling China to export. Uh, India's uh, a diaspora in the North America is professionals uh, and they are not that much that kind of market oriented. Secondly, our diaspora, if I may call it that, after all, Bangladesh, Nepal, India, Pakistan, we're all part of the same uh, country once upon a time. Uh, this diaspora is of no use to India because they happen to be poorer than India. Uh, there is a, 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 nothing that Pakistan or uh, Bangladesh uh, can really offer India. So I would say that uh, the Chinese uh, advantage is not in the amount of revenue that's not insignificant. It's in the fact that this, uh, this diaspora is uh, market savvy and they enable the Chinese to be able to do international trade. And whereas India 
except in the IT field, and that too because of special reasons. Uh, then other areas that have been helpful, but uh, they haven't made that kind of difference which the Chinese diaspora has made. I'm a local student for local science at UIL. Um, my question is about rural population and job creation out of agriculture. And if you said that approximately 2 million need to be moved into something else, what about uh, processing zones uh, that are like China and Latin America? Are these a good biological option? You mean moving biological option? Well, there's been these zones that have been created. So oh, you mean special economic zones? But are they good for the population at all, or are they special? Well, I think, uh, you know, these special economic zones are really meant for special laws. Uh, but if, if the whole country needs uh, a labor reform, these special economic zones <coughs> are not going to be able uh, to give you fundamental cutting edge advantage. In the case of China, of course, because they, it was a different society altogether. It was a highly controlled society, and the SCZs in Shenzhen and all provided an island on which people could go. Uh, the main problem in, uh, in India with these special economic zones has been the fact that the government has acquired the land and then given it to the industrialists. What they should have said is to ask the industrialists to directly negotiate with the farmers and the landowners. And that would have meant uh, a, a, many of these problems that you are having of, uh, of uh, peasants going on the boat and of police firing and so on would not have taken place. And I think the government got into this act perhaps probably because some politicians wanted to make money. Otherwise, there was no reason for them, the government, to take the responsibility of acquiring uh, the land for the, for the private sector. So I, I can't see the ACZ making much difference in terms of transferring people. What can make a difference is a fast-growing manufacturing sector. We still need a manufacturing sector which must grow fast. And that uh, that's the only way to get additional employment, particularly at the blue-collar level. And uh, we can't rely on uh, cutting-edge uh, industries like IT and pharmaceuticals and biotechnology, which India has a fair amount of development to provide the this kind of bulk product. So I think the focus should be on the industry. One question, another minor comment. Uh, the question might be slightly outside the scope of this lecture, but still disconnected. Yes. What do you think of uh, this uh, nuclear agreement in the United States? That's the question. Uh, the comments, the minor comment, you seem to have assigned great weight for the going to cave, I think, for the actual industry. My own experience is not so much. Just on a question, just to Yeah, I was going to respond to that also. <coughs> but as far as the media deal is concerned, uh, I think there is a major trust deficit <coughs> that exists between India and the United States, <coughs> which is not being addressed. Are we partners with the United States? Or are we not? A deal of this kind can only be successful if there is a, a durable partnership between India and the United States. Otherwise, it is subject to interpretation. India is on the verge of a major uh, nuclear revolution in terms of fuel. It will make a breakthrough within the next four or five years in uh, uh, in uh, 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 thorium technology. Yeah. First, we uh, the uh, experimentation that is taking place, but ultimately, we have 80% of the world's thorium and uranium is depleting. Of course, we have also projects like Canada on, on uh, hydrogen fuel cells, which I hope succeeds, because that will mean the end of the West Asian. Uh, aid to terrorism perhaps. Uh, I don't know, but the fact is that uh, in the energy field, if uh, thorium cycle is uh, finally commercialized, then I think India will not need anybody's help to, uh, uh, to generate enough energy. However, uh, this present deal uh, is based on mutual suspicion. Both are democracies. <coughs> they talk to the press. A lot of bad feeling easily created. 
the fundamental flaw in this agreement, where the trust deficit becomes important, is the requirement that India separate its military reactors from the civilian reactors. But added to it is a clause that if you use any product of the civilian reactors in the future in the military reactors, then that will become equally safeguarded. It's called the pursuit clause. This is something uh, which would mean that uh, uh, either India will have to now build newer civilian facilities for uh, camouflaged, because civilian uh, nuclear reactors henceforth have to come under safeguards under the agreement, uh, have to build camouflaged uh, nuclear reactors uh, to provide the necessary input into the military reactors to make the new military reactors self efficient or face the prospect that over the years that everything of the Indian, of the Indian uh, nuclear industry would come under safeguards. Now, having not signed the non nutrition treaty, there is no reason why India should now accept the discipline of the non nutrition treaty as a non-nuclear weapons power. The case of Iran is different. Iran is a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty since 1978. And therefore, if it breaks the law, it is a breakage of the law. In India, India has never signed it, faced the sanctions when necessary. And today, all of a sudden, you start accepting de facto uh, the, uh, the, uh, the safeguards <coughs> that were emphasized in the Non-Proliferation Treaty. I think uh, <clears throat> is a is a question which India has to do some calculation on. Can you trust the Americans not to uh, interpret the statutes, the Hyde Act in particular, uh, as a, a in a way that is detrimental to India? It depends on who the president is. Depends on who the uh, Indian prime minister is. I would think, therefore, India should, uh, if it's going to partner with the United States on anything should come to a formal conclusion that uh, we, and, uh, we and the United States have some common concerns on which we work together. And I think uh, there uh, is finding it very difficult. Take for example the question of India sending troops to, uh, to Iraq. It was agreed and the Deputy Prime Minister of India came to Washington and gave an assurance that yes, troops will be sent, 20,000 will go in the beginning and then there will be more. And then went back and parliament passed a resolution on the day the Saddam statue fell in Baghdad that uh, it is an act of imperialism and uh, condemned the American invasion of Iraq. I mean, it's a total somersault, but then not, it's not something that will inspire confidence. Today, <coughs> the major partner of the, uh, of the government in power today, the communists, they are saying we are against this treaty because it will increase the proximity of India to the United States. So this lack of clarity as to how we regard the United States. Osama bin Laden is not in any, under any confusion. He says Israel, India and the United States, they are three enemies of Islam. Of Islam anyway. But that's what he has said. He, the, the others are, the opponents are clear. But in India we are still not clear as to what our relationship is. States. And in that, such an agreement, in my opinion, is doomed to failure. Yes, sir. Ford firm is headed by an Indian immigrant entrepreneur. In addition, many of them go off and establish uh, foreign subsidiaries or new firms in India. If we look over at Canada, we see a much higher percentage of uh, Indians in the population, of a much higher caliber, you know, generally speaking, because we have a point system. And yet, we fail to see that really great burgeoning of uh, Indian entrepreneurship or of transnational entrepreneurship between the two. So my question is, is there anything that you think uh, Canadians can do or Canada can do at large to facilitate that, that kind of environment that, that's so robust? Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. What? Thank you. I think uh, uh, your reaction to things which India did uh, was so highly moralistic uh, in the past. And I think you had a foreign minister called Axbury, or something, what do you call it? I mean, his, his, uh, his, his phraseology, I think, irritated Indians to no end. 
I think uh, probably uh, that has changed since uh, uh, 2002. And uh, what needs to be done is uh, uh, Canada has to uh, has to have the same kind of uh, open relationship which the United States uh, nurtures the economic field with India. Uh, I, I, I see them on many things. I, I was talking to an Indian diplomat whom I have not named, who is expressing great unhappiness that Canada says that they are with us on terrorism, but they give a free run to the LTTE in Canada. Even though it has declared LTTE formally as a, uh, as a terrorist organization, but the uh, LTTE is controlled temples here, they collect funds from the LTTE here, and Canadians uh, are taking a very lax attitude. Mali, India, to address uh, a impression differently is there in India, that Canada is uh, uh, highly moralistic with us and it's very difficult to work with that. That, uh, that background may be that. Second is there has to be some slack available before we can think of another country. The Americans are like a bottomless pit, you see. Uh, they are able to suck in uh, talents at great levels. Uh, this demographic hole that now has come in Western societies, uh, India is the only country which is going to have surplus uh, of that uh, age group, and uh, the Americans uh, pull that much faster. I think a, a effort has to be made, and uh, Canada must be seen in the forefront of political issues uh, outside of India. And uh, it's at the moment very understated, and that, that relationship that will not excite uh, collaboration between two countries. Relationship. China and India. Is there a scenario where they become much more collaborative and look towards um, kind of common interests? And, and by, by coincidence, uh, Harvard University Fairbank Center and uh, China's uh, Tsinghua University both uh, uh, asked me to convene an international conference on India, China, United States triangle. And that's the next January. Uh, I'm holding it in, in India. I think this is a very, very important question. And I don't say United States, it's, I would say North America, because uh, there are many aspects, in, for instance, in, uh, uh, you mentioned in energy, for example, in terms of uh, uh, certain specialized skills that Canada has, that even Canada and United States could be taken as one. Uh, but I, I think. Uh, uh, we have a, India has a problem. China is a neighbor, and a neighbor which supports a troublemaker for us from our point of view, namely Pakistan. It's a very strong China Pakistan relationship, much stronger than US Pakistan relations. And uh, I would say the storming of the masjid, uh, which Musharraf, uh, 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 that mosque uh, that Musharraf did, was entirely because the, those. Uh, Mullahs went and attacked some Chinese uh, beauticians and called the prostitutes and wanted to kill them. And I think uh, uh, the Chinese lead heavily on the Pakistanis and the Pakistanis uh, delivered. The relationship between India and China has to be normal, good, I mean, because of this strategic aspect that if India was to pursue a a peaceful economic development, they should have good relations. At the same time, uh, India and the United States have shared democracy in common, they, they share many other things. We, there are many things that India wants from the United States, which China can't give to India. And how this is going to work out, I think uh, it's very difficult to say. India and China and competition in Africa, for example. Both countries are investing heavily in, uh, in Africa. Tracking uh, copper and uh, other mineral resources, um, and uh, uh, we have, when it comes to issues, I find Chinese are not very uh, helpful. For example, if India wants a membership to the Security Council on a permanent basis, uh, the Chinese have never come out of it in support. I don't know how they will react to the Indo-US nuclear deal if it goes through. Uh, 
problem in the United States is there, and there's a problem in India too, the Indian Parliament, which is in the next two weeks we'll know. Uh, so there are many areas of uh, conflict, but we also have a history of uh, maybe 2,500 years, where except once in 1962, uh, it did not have a conflict. On the other hand, people went, came to India from China, India from India, people went to China. China. Uh, the great uh, uh, Karate, which originally came from China, Shaolin as Bushir, uh, was actually by an Indian monk called Bodhidharma. Uh, who went from uh, from Tamna to to China? There were Chinese monks who came to India. Uh, we have had uh, interactions. It's not uh, and it's been always very friendly. Uh, there is a, a speech given by the president of Beijing University, Mr. Dr. Bush, in 1936 when he was invited to uh, speak at Harvard's tricentennial anniversary. And uh, Harvard is reproduced part of the Indian uh, speeches. And the title of his speech is The Indianization of China. And uh, he speaks about why China is backward. They said because India sent to university in this January. I was told by very important politicians that in order now for this jealousy factor to be minimized due to economic growth, they will have to bring back this otherworldly thinking. So in the, the name of harmonious society, they said, we may have to bring Buddhism back. And uh, the first Buddhist conference since 1949 has just recently been held in, in, in Hangzhou in China. And uh, there is definitely, culturally, uh, <coughs> even if you look different, Indians and Chinese people uh, in their family system, their, their, their innovatives, their, their gestures, there's a, we feel very comfortable with them. But there's also this other side, and I don't know how to work out. Maybe after the conference, if I come by here, I <laughs> Banks, particularly City Bank, JP Morgan, Investment Bank, Bank Express, they were out there in India for a long time, doing very brisk business, retail, especially. The Canadian banks are not enough, so really promising once here. Uh, you have a great pension funds here. Are we going to lost the lost in the race, or can we do anything here? No, no, I think this is the area, the financial services area. I think Canadians, I, I, I have heard many people in India say that rather than the American were overextended, we should, uh, you know, get the Canadians to come and their recognized expertise of the Canadians and financial services. Now, I, I think this is the right moment to go. Go. And the things are opening up also in the other financial sector. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, in my course, I have one lecture devoted to governance in which uh, I talk about corruption in both countries. Certainly, transparency, uh, international index, uh, uh, India and China are well down the list because we may be ahead of Bangladesh, I don't know, uh, <laughs> or uh, Burma or uh, Nepal. But uh, certainly, we are as far down the list in the very corrupt countries. How does one solve? Uh, problems of corruption in, in the developing society like India and China. Well, first of all, there have been areas in India where there was terrible corruption, and today there is no corruption. Those stories are not being <coughs> circulated. For example, in, uh, up to 1991, the most harassing corruption that people used to mention on a daily basis was in railway reservations. Uh, people could get a reserve ticket on the train uh, without paying a bribe to the ticket counter, uh, or at the, when you get on the train without a confirmed reservation and the conductor is there in bribe you. Uh, and it was a stinking amount of corruption. Then computerization came. And uh, uh, today there's no corruption because they Computerization you can't change the waiting list, you, and everything is published, printed, you can acquire, access it on your mobile, uh, and so on. So today, we have no corruption in railway reservation, which is something which could never have been imagined. So
So one way of removing corruption is to get to this um, uh, the information technology techniques to be brought in. And we are finding that now with government forms also. Uh, a lot of government forms can be downloaded. And so uh, there the corruption is to be Where the corruption is still very high is in the area of uh, political politicians accepting bribes for, for an inferior decision uh, because the inferior product which they wanted to sell or have a contract on uh, could not uh, meet the competitive standards. So you you got some reason and give it to somebody who is inferior but because he is paying your bribe. And that has devastating effects in a number of areas. For example, uh, in roads, we build the best roads in the world outside India. But in India, within India, our roads are terrible. Go to Bangalore and you see uh, the IT capital of now uh, emerging IT capital of the world, the roads are terrible because the politician has to be paid a cut for giving you the contract and that cut is unbearable. So he uh, puts substandard material and one rainfall and the whole thing goes. Uh, we are, Indian roads are there to see in Iraq, which we built before the Americans came, in Nigeria, in, in Malaysia, and they are all top class roads that last for a long time. But in India, no road lasts more than one, one monsoon. So, uh, uh, therefore, that's because the politicians are discretionary, uh, very has to make decisions. There are, of course, bigger corruption, defense schemes, and so on. Now, what's the cure for that? And I have uh, mathematically shown, by use of uh, the expected value, that even if the probability of catching somebody is small, uh, if you haven't caught him, if you give him a very harsh punishment, then it is a deterrent factor for others. I can show that the expected value from a bribe is negative. If the expected value uh, of a bribe is negative, then nobody will be rationally there, that corrupt. Uh, so therefore, how does one make it that way? And I have shown by my mathematics that it's actually uh, the punishment should be very severe. Now, uh, I, I think the Americans have got the right idea when they put skilling in a handcuff or a Martha Stewart in, uh, on a, on a, a flimsy slim, uh, thing or Nixon for uh, tapping telephones in uh, tapping telephones goes on all the time. And uh, in fact, Mao Zedong couldn't understand how Nixon could lose his job because of tapping. Uh, <laughs> you know, he thought it was a privilege and uh, uh, But anyway, uh, there, if you can do that, the uh, Chinese have death penalty for corruption. But then the system is not fair. If you are an enemy of the state, then definitely. Or if some dogs uh, die due to eating dog food in the United States that brings shame to China, then the drug uh, controller in China will be given death punishment. So, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's not a uniformly applied principle, but I think uh, short of death penalty, if you can catch a few politicians who have committed drugs and give them severe punishment, including the appropriation of their properties, then I think corruption is going to attack in India. No politician yet has served a jail sentence uh, after being convicted. Uh, and uh, till that comes, uh, we'll have to live with it. Uh, I had a question uh, regarding the reservation system in India. Do you think it has an impact on Indian development or economic development? All reservations are anti merit and therefore it has an effect. But I would say any section of Indian society, if it has imposed disabilities, not acquired disabilities, but imposed disabilities, then it is entitled for a period of time for reservations. And I would say Shiddhul Kast and Shiddhul tribes of the Hindu community and are entitled to reservations. On that I'm absolutely no doubt. But today the government is saying they should Muslims and Christians are also, particularly those Christians who have been converted from the, the so called untouchable, ex untouchable class into Christianity. They should be given reservations. I have thoroughly approved that because neither the Muslim community nor the Christian community has any imposed disabilities. On the contrary, 
the Muslims and the Christians ruled India for a thousand years together, sequentially. And uh, having ruled for a thousand years, nobody can now say that uh, they have imposed this in peace. And therefore, I would thoroughly oppose any reservation uh, which is for non imposed disability. Therefore, poverty, it cannot be an argument for reservation because the Brahmin community, which is socially the most prestigious, is also one of the poorest in the country. So, what we need to do is to see that people get education, access to the education. And many of the youngsters whom I taught at IIT who say that we don't want reservations, but we come from municipal school where there's no teacher and there's no blackboard, there's no, you know, the, the roof leaks. And then you ask us to compete uh, with the, with the uh, private school, uh, people have come out of private schools in the IIT exam. Where there's an unfair competition. We just can't make the competition, so we need reservations. So therefore, our primary and secondary education needs to be given a great deal of emphasis. Uh, Canada can play an extremely important role in this uh, in ensuring that our primary and education Thank you. 